Hey guys, it's Sarah. In this video, I'm going to be going over part two of the Family Nurse Practitioner Board Review. So we had part one. You can look at the link above and watch that. And this is part two, and that will be your whole review. Just before I get started, I just want to let you know that if you want all this in a PDF form, you could check out the link below and you could follow with us that way. Otherwise, just listen. So let's get started. So here's the index we already covered in part one from the beginning until sexual transmitted infections and now we're going to be going on from contraception and on. So let's get started. So here is just a chart of a bunch of contraceptions and I wouldn't really memorize this it's not really that much tested on but the main points that you have to know I'm going to be discussing after I show you this. So here is part two of the list. These are much more common oral contraception and IUDs are probably the most common things that people use to prevent pregnancy and that's why anything that's common you should know because the boards are going to test you about what your majority of your population is going to be like. So on the right side you're going to see is the medications you know like the examples um, like the Dipropovera for the injections. But I just want to say about the Dipro it increases the risk of osteoporosis. So a lot of women are more prone to osteoporosis. So if they do have, you want to make sure not to put them on this. Okay, so contraceptives in general, you always want to do a urine pregnancy test before to rule out pregnancy before you start putting them on a birth control. Then whenever you start, you want them to use a backup method for the first seven days of starting. And you want, always want to follow them up in three months after you first prescribe them. If they missed one birth control, because they like to test on this, because this is very common, someone forgets their birth control, etc. So if they miss one, like the oral one, then the, you want them to take two pills and then continue the regular pack. If they miss two days of pills, then you want them to take the most recent pill whenever they remember, get rid of the other pill, and continue taking as usual and use backup method for seven days. So just remember that if they miss one day, so one pill, take the one that they missed from yesterday and today, and continue the work. If they miss two days of pills, you want them to take the most recent one, disregard the other one, and use backup method for seven days. You should know contraindications for hormonal contraceptives. So a lot of people are on the oral birth control, and there are two different types of oral ones. There are the progesterone only, so people who are breastfeeding take that. It's called the mini pill. But mostly everyone else takes the combined. It's combined estrogen and progesterone. So these are people who are contraindicated that should not have. And this, and this list I would just memorize. The blood clot, history of DVT, anyone is, that has elevated LFTs, cardiac disease, older than 35, and smokes more than 15 packs a day because they're predisposed to clots also. Of course, pregnancy, breast cancer, ovarian cancer, etc. Basically, any condition that increases the risk of a clot. Contraindications for IUD. This I would also know because IUD is fairly common, is a recent, recent pelvic infection, pregnancy obviously, anatomical uterine abnormality, and you want to caution with these following patients, irregular bleeding, abnormal pap, multiple sexual partners, and immunosuppressed. So not to say that they can't use it, but more caution. And contraindication to progesterone therapy, which is like mini pill, etc., is liver disease and thromboembolism disorder. Emergency contraceptive is basically the morning and after pill. You want to take within 72 hours after unprotected sex and always rule out pregnancy. So now we're going to go on to just woman's health. Here's just the menses cycle in the front. I would just skip that. It's good to know, but they're not going to test you on. Amenorrhea is a lack of menstruation. This is very common. You have your primary, you have your secondary. Primary is basically, it's a female who never had the period by age 15, and secondary means that they had the period, but all of a sudden they didn't have it for the past three months. So, so primary could be a lot of different reasons, genetic, hormonal, etc. So you want to check, you know, the prolactin level, TSH, FSH, LH, rule out pregnancy, you know, do all that work up to find out why they didn't get it by the age of 15. Secondary um, could be caused by menopause, especially if in that age, hormonal death, eating disorder, stress, obesity. So if they have a secondary, you obviously want to treat the cause, find it out and treat it. Dysmenorrhea is painful menstrual cramps, very common. Treatment is going to be heating pads, NSAIDs, Tylenol, etc. 
Menopause is basically when they don't have a period for 12 months later in life. So, you know, between, you know, 45, 55 around, but average age is 51. If they're menopausal with vaginal bleeding, then you're always worried about malignancy. So in general, anyone who has bleeding and doesn't have their period, so think about, you know, a 60 year old woman, you always want to rule out malignancy. Symptoms of menopause are half flashes, mood changes, vaginal dryness, weight gain. You want to treat them symptomatically. Herbal substances such as black cohosh, etc. Hormonal therapy could be used, but it's really not something you want to go to because it has a lot of side effects. So like we said, postmenopausal vaginal bleeding, you always want to refer them to rule out endometrial cancer. Um, atrophic vaginitis is a lack of estrogen from menopause, so it could cause like a lot of dryness, especially if they're sexually active. So treatment is going to be moisturizers, lubricants, if they fail that, then topical estrogen. So pap smear is part of our screening, and this they love to test on. So pap smear is used to screen for cervical cancer. I would just memorize all this. It starts at age 21, every five years, age 30, every five years, which a with HPV testing. After 65, if it's normal and there's no risk, then you want to discontinue the pap smear. So in terms of the results, if they have atypical squamous cell or undetermined significance, so there's no cancer cells, but the cells are not um, normal either, I guess you would say. So you want to tell the patient to follow up for HPV testing. And if that comes back positive, then you want to refer them to a colposcopy. If they have a hysterectomy, you don't need a screen because we're not worried about that. Mammograms, mammograms, you want them from 50 and up to be screened every two years for breast cancer. If they're high risk, then obviously they're screened earlier. And so it's from 50 to 75. After 75, there's no longer needed if it's normal. Fibrocystic breasts are basically breast lumps. They usually enlarge right before menstrual period and they're going to feel like rubbery, firm, sore, but they're always movable. If they're not movable, you want to think of cancer. It's very easily to, dis to distinguish from cancer because they are painful and breast cancer is not painful. Treatment is going to be over-the-counter analgesics. You could always refer them to a GYN and you could always do an, a breast ultrasound to rule out if you are concerned about cancer. So breast cancer, we do have the breast self-examination, but honestly, that hasn't really been shown to be that effective. It's usually after 50, which is why we do the mammogram, starting at 50, risk factors, the BRCA gene, genetics, family history is a huge one. Symptoms, like we said before, it's not going to be painful and not movable. So if it's movable and painful, um, especially before a period, you want to more like think for cystic breasts. It's diagnosed with ultrasound, mammogram, and obviously you're going to be referring them out. So Paget's disease of the breast is a rare form of breast cancer. Um, the main symptom you want to think about is going to be like um, areola is going to look crusty, scaly, and red. You're going to want to refer them to biopsy because like I just said, it's breast cancer. BV. So bacterial vaginosis is from an overgrowth of bacteria in the vagina. The main symptom that they like to test on and everyone likes to say is a fishy odor. They also have milky discharge, but the fishy odor is the main one that will clue you into bacterial vaginosis. And the next clue that they're going to say is diagnosed with clue cells on the wet mount and a positive whiff test. So positive whiff test, clue cells, and fishy odor, you always want to think of bacterial vaginosis. The treatment is going to be metronidazole. That I would know that because it's quite common and they like to test on that. Vulvovaginal vaginal candidiasis is a yeast infection. Candidiasis is a yeast infection. All yeast infections, risk factors, immunosuppressed, antibiotics use, steroid use, or anything that pretty much promotes yeast growth. So symptoms for this is going to be cottage cheese discharge, and that's very specific. So anytime you see cottage cheese discharge, you want to think of candidiasis. Endometriosis. Endometriosis is basically tissue growing outside of the uterus. So they're going to have very painful menstrual cycles. Treatment, that's going to be GYN, so refer them out. 
The next one thing we're going to be talking about is PCOS. PCOS is quite common also. It's a hormonal imbalance. Symptoms, you're going to be having like a woman with a lot of acne, even facial hair, or just more hair, weight gain, irregular menses. It's going to be diagnosed with a symptoms complication. It's going to be insulin resistant, hyperlipidemia, hypertension. And you want to treat them. They're usually treated with weight loss, first of all, contraceptive, but also um, like other medications, metformin. So now we're also talking about women's health. We're talking about pregnancy. They're not going to necessarily test you so much on this because for the most part, they're going to be seeing their GYN. But you do have to know if a patient comes in, you do have to rule out emergencies and know what to do. But you're not going to be measuring their fundal height and stuff like that. So that's why I'm going to be skipping over a lot of, you know, pre-contraceptive, obviously, folic acid, prenatals, etc. There are three signs. Of pregnancy you have your presumptive probable and positive positive is the ones that are for sure baby presumptive are subjective so whatever the patient's telling you so they're telling you that they're nauseous or telling you breast tenderness or telling you they don't have their period anymore that's what they're telling you you can't tell them that probable are a what you're seeing so you're going to be doing you know some tests the Hager sign pregnancy test Chadwick sign you know if it's blue discoloration of the cervix or your Chadwick sign, all these signs that you're seeing. So presumptive is subjective, what the patient's telling you they feel, why they think they're pregnant. Probable is what you see when you do a vaginal exam and do a pregnancy test. And positive is the only three, so this is why I would just remember, positive is palpation of the fetus, ultrasound, and fetal heart tones. So the mnemonic is PUF, P-U-F, palpation, ultrasound, fetal tones. So that's the only way you could actually confirm a pregnancy. Ectopic pregnancy is when it just implants out of the uterus. Symptom, pelvic pain, vaginal bleeding. So this is going to be diagnosed through the labs and ultrasound. You always want to rule this out because you're always concerned that it's going to rupture. So if you suspect, you want to refer them out really quickly. Nagel sign is just how to calculate due date. They're not going to ask you on that. Normal in pregnancy, so these are all normal. For someone who's underweight, you want them to gain more. Someone who's overweight, you want them to gain less. And in terms of blood types, so if mom is RH negative and baby's RH positive and incompatible, so when there's a delivery happening and the blood could mix and then they could develop antibodies, so the next time they get pregnant, basically, there's antibodies against that. So that's why if that happens and they're opposites, then we give Rogam to them. But for most probably, this would be done in a woman's health GYN would be doing this. So some issues during pregnancy that you want to watch out for is premature labor, labor before 37 weeks, and you want to immediately send them out. Preeclampsia. So preeclampsia is something you could see because this is just high blood pressure and symptoms of organ damage. So after 20 weeks of pregnancy, this has to happen, and their symptoms are going to be edema, headache, vision changes, proteinuria. You want to refer them out immediately, and honestly, the only true way to cure this is delivery. Placenta previa and placenta abruption. So placenta previa, so you have your PP, so the P stands for previa and painless. Placenta abruption is going to be painful. So if they say painless bleeding, you want to think of previa, painful bleeding, bleeding, abruption. And just think if something's abrupting, you're going to be painful. So previa is when the placenta partially or completely covers the cervix, and abruption is when it completely separates. The next thing you should know is about postpartum. So postpartum depression, like some people think it's just right after the baby, but it really collapses up to, up to a year after delivery. So this should be screened by the baby's visits also. Treatments for this are antidepressants, CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, etc. Usually after pregnancy, mom's breastfeeding, so you could have mastitis. Mastitis is inflammation of the breast tissue from an infection. Symptoms are going to come in with warm, tender, baggy breast pretty much, fever, malaise. You want to treat them with antibiotics and that's pretty much it. If they're breastfeeding, like we said before, we give them the mini pill for contraceptive. And one thing you want to know is that if they come in with a soft boggy uterus and heavy vaginal bleeding, you want to be concerned for uterine atony. So on the top is just a lot of tests that are done on what week they're done, but generally they're done by an OBGYN. 
other pregnancy information that you should just know about the stretch marks, all this type of stuff, this is basically, like I just said, all done by OBGYN. So these are drugs in pregnancy that we're going to be going through the different categories. This you should know because even if you are pregnant, you still have a primary care. So these are medications that you would be prescribing for them, but either do or don't want them. So category A is no risk to pregnant women. So like vitamin A, Synthroid, they could still be taking their Synthroid and prenatals. So category B is still safe because there's no risk in animals, but there was no study done in humans. So this is your penicillin. So we could give amoxicillin, calcium channel blocker, beta blocker, Tylenol is the medication for pain usually, etc. Category C, it's not tested in pregnancy. So your sulfa, your NSAIDs. NSAIDs um, have a risk of premature closure of the duct. And category D and X, you really don't want to do because category D, the benefits don't outweigh the risk, and category X has proven fatal risk. So category X medications, big no-no, and D. So for example, Accutane, you don't want to do Proscar, Warfarin, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, you don't want your tetracyclines, etc. And your tetragenics are were harmful for the baby. You know, they cause defects. So number one, alcohol. Number two, cigarettes, cocaine, and in parentheses, I write what they could cause. Aminoglycosides, lithium, etc. Okay, now that we're done women's health, we're going to go on to men's health. So number one, we're talking about prostate. When it comes to the prostate, it's in front of the rectum, surrounds the urethra, and it helps make fluid for the semen. Usually the size of a walnut, but very common, especially as men get older, BPH, benign prostate aplasia, and that's basically when it enlarges, usually after 50. The problem is, is that it compresses because it surrounds the urethra, like I just said, so there's issues with urination. So sometimes they could have, you know, little dribbles, hesitancy, frequency, weak stream, etc. It's going to be diagnosed through a DRE and Classically, what they like to write in the textbook is a rubbery prostate. First line treatment is going to be your alpha blockers, which end in zosin, so terazosin, etc. What they do is, is they vasodilate so they alleviate the symptoms, but they still have um, side effects. Another option is your finasteride, and you have your herbs like saw, palmetto, etc. Next, we go on to prostatitis, and this is inflammation of the prostate gland, because itis means inflammation, so of the prostate. So, symptoms are going to be tender prostate, and the main thing they like to ask for is the boggy prostate. So, if they say like it feels like a sponge and soft or boggy, then you want to, or swollen, then you want to think of prostatitis. You want to do a urine culture, STD testing, and treatment with fluid glands. Prostate cancer is usually, as someone gets older, family history is a big one, age, African Americans are risk factor. They could be asymptomatic, but if they are, are coming with symptoms, it's usually avoiding symptoms, lower back pain. You always want to do a DRE, digital rectal exam, and what you're going to feel is you're going to feel fixed and asymmetric nodules on the prostate. If you suspect, you want to screen for PSA, and this will be referral to urology. So next we go on to a different part, which is the scrotum and the testes. So testicular cancer is one of the type of cancers that are actually more common in younger patients. So you want to screen this for your patients between age 15 and age 50. They're usually going to feel firm, fixed, painless mass on one of their testes. You can do an ultrasound and refer them to urology for biopsy. Next we go on to epididymitis. Epididymitis is an inflammation of epididymis. Like I just said, itis, inflammation, epididymis. So for this, the treatment's different because if they're less than 35 years old, then you want to assume that it's from STD and then they're treated with rocephin, doxycycline. If they're more than 35 years old, then it's usually from a bladder alpha obstruction and, you know, like from bacteria and you want to treat them with antibiotics, fluoroquinone. So under 35 years old, you want to treat them like an SED. Over 35 years old, fluoroquinolones. Testicular torsion. This is very important, and this is tested on a lot because you don't want to miss this. Because if you miss this within six hours, they could have permanent damage. 
to their testicles, especially fertility, etc. So this is when a twist of the spermatic cord, and what they're going to come in is sudden unilateral testicular pain, nausea, vomiting, but even just sudden unilateral. You want them to go for testing right away for ultrasound, and this is an immediate referral to the ED. So now we're just going to be talking about disorders of the penis. So erectile dysfunction is your main one that you're going to see. It's difficulty initiating or sustaining an erection. Causes, there are many causes you want to rule out before just starting someone on like Viagra. You want to rule out, number one, that could be from psychogenic, like stress, anxiety, depression. Number two, it could be organic, some medications, especially the SSRIs are known to do that. And or it could be a mix. It could be a combination of organic and psychogenic. So you want to find out the cause first, and then you could do the treatment. Treatment is usually, number one, stopping to smoke, decrease stress if it's caused from that. And then you could start them on Viagra. Before starting someone on Viagra, you want to do a cardiac workup. So EKG, etc. If it's abnormal, wait before you prescribe it. Refer them to cardiologists. So next we go on to musculoskeletal system. So here are just some terms in the front that you should know. You know what a sprain, a strain is, what the bursa is, etc. And here are just some common bones that you can know also and location. So this is what you should just know and look up on your regular time because if someone says like lateral, you should know what they're talking about. And this is how you document like lateral, or abducted, medial, etc. So these are different tests. Like I said before, we have a whole video that's under 10 minutes on all the tests, not only the musculoskeletal tests, all the tests we have to know. So I'm going to skip that and you click up for the link below or above for that video. So plantar fasciitis is inflammation of the plantar fascia. Symptoms are going to have heel and the bone of like the foot's going to have a pain that's worse when they walk and worse in the morning. You want to treat them with exercises like to stretch, of barefoot walking and NSAIDs. So in general, a lot of the musculoskeletal, it's really just about rice. So rest, ice, compression, elevation. You want them to have good footwear, sometimes brace, splint, etc. But there's really not much unless it's fracture that we do. Osteoporosis is very, very, very common. It's basically when the bones become porous, so they grow weaker and puts them at risk for fracture because they're weaker bones. Symptoms are usually asymptomatic, and usually the first time you actually know that they have osteoporosis is because they had a fracture. Risk factors is a white female, certain medications, like I said, the Depo-Provera, steroids, and very low weight, and smoking. So prevention, you want them to do weight-bearing exercises, calcium, vitamin D, and you want them to be screened for it over 65. So it's going to be diagnosed with a DEXA scan. Normal is going to be less than one. Osteopenia, which is when the bones become more brittle, but they're not entirely porous like osteoporosis. So osteopenia is negative one to negative 2.5, and osteoporosis is negative 2.5 and less. The DEXA is actually screening done on all women 65 and older, or a low trauma fracture with someone who's younger just to see why did they fracture it. Treatment, your first line is going to be the biphosphonates, all end in like jornate, alendronate, etc. You also want to tell them, you know, calcium, vitamin D, weight bearing exercises, like rheumatoid arthritis, and osteoarthritis. So, rheumatoid arthritis is an immune disorder, and osteoarthritis is from wear and tear. And if you actually think about the pathophysiology and everything, you'll be able to know the difference. So, with rheumatoid arthritis, your symptoms are going to be symmetrical because it's autoimmune. With osteoarthritis, it's usually wear and tear. So generally, you could have like asymmetrical. With rheumatoid arthritis, it does not resolve in the morning. With osteoarthritis, it generally resolves in an hour of them waking up. The key symptoms that they're going to ask is that for rheumatoid arthritis, you're going to see your deformity, so it's going to be a hyperextension of the PIP joint, and swan neck deformity. For the osteoarthritis, you're going to have the Bouchard's nodes and the her. For rheumatoid arthritis, you might have warmth, you might have redness, etc. 
and for osteoarthritis, you're generally not going to. For rheumatoid arthritis, you want to refer to a rheumatologist, and they usually treat them with like DMARDs, etc. For osteoarthritis, it's usually exercise, PT, NSAIDs, the same thing for all the musculoskeletal because NSAIDs decrease inflammation, so they're great to use. Okay, so lower back pain. Lower back pain is really common, even in younger people, just because people are not lifting right, people are not doing exercise before their workup. So it could be due to multiple causes. You always want to rule out fractures and other serious causes like cancer, infection, aortic aneurysm. So in order to do that, you always have to listen to the HMP. So if there's trauma involved or you know other systemic symptoms, then you might want to think that, oh, it's not just regular back pain. So you really want to get a good HMP. If you suspect a herniating disc, you could do an MRI. If it's uncomplicated, it's regular back pain, you give them NSAIDs like naproxen, even give them muscle relaxer. Just tell them to do exercise to strengthen their back, and you could refer them to a chiropractor if needed. Cordoicardis syndrome. This is something you don't want to miss. This is when nerves in the cordoicardis bottom of the spinal cord, they get compressed and damaged. So the symptoms that they're going to say is saddle anesthesia. That's usually numbness and tingling in that area, like as if you were sitting on a horse in that area. And new incontinence. So if someone comes in with saddle anesthesia and unable to urinate, then you automatically want to think cordoicardis syndrome. It's most commonly caused by a herniated disc in the lumbar spine, and this is an immediate referral to the ED because it's a surgical emergency. It has to be decompressed. ACL injury is quite common also, especially people who play sports, because ACL is a ligament that stabilizes the knee joint. The main symptom that you're going to hear is you're going to hear a pop and then swelling right after. So if you hear a pop in the knee, swelling right after, you want to think ACL injury. You could do the Lachman and anterior draw test and refer them to ortho. Meniscus tear. Meniscus is the cartilage in the knee. It's commonly torn a lot just because with sports symptoms, they're going to hear the popping also of the knee. And you're going to test them with McMurray's test. If the clicking, positive. Treatment is going to be rest, ice, compression, elevations, arise, strengthening exercises, and refer them to ortho. Okay, so here on top, you're going to see grades, grade 1, grade 2, grade 3. This is talking about sprains. You have an Ottawa rule which will help you tell you if you should x-ray or not. The next thing you're going to be seeing is you're going to be seeing a comparison chart between osteomyelitis, septic arthritis. Osteomyelitis is an infection of the bone. Septic arthritis is inflammation of the, of the bone. They generally come in with the same symptoms, limited use of extremity, tenderness, swelling, warmth. But the most commonly located in different locations, osteomyelitis is generally located in the femur, and septic arthritis is generally located more like in the knee or hip. Treatment, you want to refer them both out to the ED because they're going to need antibiotics, surgical deb debridement, etc. Rotator cuff injury is quite common, especially golf, tennis, swimming, stuff that are using like your shoulder like that. So for that, there's a lot of tests you could do, the drop arm test, you could do the painful arc test, all different tests to see if the patient holds their arm up, etc. For treatment, you're going to have rest, cold packs, PT, NSAIDs, or throw involved, pretty much like all the other ones. Next, we go on to epicondylitis. Epicondylitis is inflammation of a tendon around the elbow. What you should know about this is that if it's lateral, it's called tennis elbow. Medial, it's called golfer's elbow, and just the way that someone golfs versus um, playing tennis versus golf. Gout. Gout is quite common. Gout is something that the patient's usually, it's usually going to be on their big toe. They're going to come in complaining. It's going to be red, hot, tender, swollen, and they usually have flare-ups, especially if they eat meat, alcohol, seafood. Usually diagnosed with joint aspiration to remove the sample of the fluid looking for crystals. Other than that, you could do some lab testing, you know, they'll have elevated white blood cell count, CBC, ESR. In terms of treatment for gout, so there are two different types. You have your maintenance and you have your acute. For an acute attack, so they're coming in right now with a gout attack, you want to do, give them potent NSAIDs, so like indomethacine or steroids. 
If it's severe, you give them a colchicine. And for maintenance therapy, you want to give allopurinol. So they like to ask that, which one are you going to give for acute and maintenance? So maintenance is going to be your allopurinol, and the treatment for acute is going to be NSAIDs and colchicine, steroids, etc. Now we're going to compare and contrast choline's fracture to scaphoid bone fracture. They're just different types. So choline fracture is basically distal radial fracture. Scaphoid fracture is a break in one of the small bones of the wrist. They're both going to be caused by if someone falls and then tries to break their fall by putting their hand down. So they're going to like put their hand down like that, and that's what causes those fractures. Symptoms, so Cohen's fracture, the way they like to describe it, is a dinner fork shape because their finger is going to look like a dinner sharp fork shape. Scaphoid fracture, they're going to have snuff box tenderness. So those are the two differentiating symptoms that generally they like to test on. Usually going to be diagnosed with x-ray, though sometimes a scaphoid fracture can take up to two weeks to show itself on x-ray. For those, you want to splint the wrist and refer them to ortho. Okay, so now we go on to pediatrics. Pediatrics is, it's like a specialty, it's not your regular med surge as you would call it, so we don't have to know it that in depth, but you do have to know it because you will see kids in your practice. You know, kids should have a pediatrician, but a lot of them will come to urgent cares or they will come to family practice, especially like a kid like a five-year-old or a ten-year-old, etc. So here's just regular information you should know. Anterior fontanelle closes when the posterior fontanelle closes. Um, what's normal, what's abnormal for babies, so that you can just read. Reflux, you should know when it disappears because if they still have it abnormal and then you want to get them further worked up. Okay, now we go on to immunizations because that's a big part of pediatrics. They get them quite often. It's honestly just memorization, so I'm not going to go into it. I'll just give you one tip is that 246 is the same exact immunizations. Two, four, six months, same exact immunizations, except for six months is when you start the yearly flu, and zero months, so at birth, two months and six months is happy. So zero, two, six, happy, two, four, six have the same exact immunizations, and we have the yearly one. So in terms of immunizations, just general information, number one, pregnant woman and Babies under 12 months, severely immunocompromised patients, generally should not receive any live vaccines. So that's why if you see after 12 months, then we start all the MMRs, varicella, etc. So you're never going to give a live vaccine to a baby under 1 years old or pregnant or immunocompromised. You could give a patient a vaccine even if they had a penicillin allergy, mild illness, recurrent infection, or an antibiotics. Normal vaccine reactions, so these are not adverse reactions, these are normal reactions. Soreness, redness, mild fever. You can just put a warm compress on it. They can take Tylenol, ibuprofen as needed. A patient with a history of seizures to get a separate MMR and varicella and not the combination one. Information on specific vaccines that you should know. Number one is Tdap is for over seven years old. Ddap is for under seven years old. How I like to remember that is T is for tall, so over seven, the kids are taller, and under seven is D for down. They're usually shorter. I also have a whole video I made on immunization, so if you do want that, you can look in the section below. We well, should know hepatitis B needs to be four weeks apart from other ones. Okay, so some more information is you want to avoid certain vaccines if Guan brain syndrome within six weeks of the vaccinations. Don't give kids aspirin within four weeks of vaccinations. And like I said before, the DTAP is for kids under seven, TDAP is for kids over seven, and TDAP is also given for any dirty wounds. So this chart over here is developmental milestones. The ones that I bolded are pretty much like the main ones, I guess you would say, to, that they're going to ask for. So by two to three months, they should be doing coo sounds, smiling. By six months, they should be sitting up. Nine months, they should be pulling to stand. A year is usually when they take the first step. And a year is when they say mama, dada. Three years is tricycles, so try three years old. They can also draw a circle, throw a ball, four years, cross, so think of a four, like that. And that's pretty much, like, there are more specific if you want to read this whole chart, but that's, the ones in bold are pretty much the main ones they like to test on. Other information you should know, anyone below the fifth percentile 
or goes more than two major percentiles off what their normal is, then you want to rule them out for failure to thrive. You have the growth curve and you plot them when they're younger, but you know someone could be always in the 80th percentile, if now they're in the 50th, that's concerning. But for someone who's always in the 50th, that's normal for them. So like I just said, any decrease in two major percentile lines or below the fifth percentile, you want to be worried. New newborns by two weeks should be back to their birth weight. Rear facing car seats till two years old with five point safety harness. This is just information that you should know. Head circumference is tested till 36 months and the ortolans and Barlow maneuver are basically placing them in frog positions so like their feet out and listening for clicks. And that's testing for developmental dysplasia of the hip. At six months, they should be doubling their weight. They should be starting to eat new foods. When they do eat new foods, you want them to eat one at a time, three to five days in between, because you have to know which one they're having a reaction to. Nine months, they have separation anxiety, usually 12 months, you want them to triple their weight. So six months, double their weight, 12 months, triple their weight. And at 12 months, we generally test for hemoglobin, for anemia, lead poisoning. And usually that's when they start with cow's milk. Okay, so 18 to 24 months, they could be forward facing, they usually start potty training. You want to screen them for autism with the MCHAT at 18 and 24 months, so that you should know. Then when they get to school age, they're in boosters. At three years old, you start the blood pressure. They're in the back seat until 12 years old, but they could be out of the booster. Um, and you want to go according to the Tanner stages. So the Tanner stages, they love to ask for. The Tanner stage, how basically, it's quite confusing. So how I like to remember it is that stage one and stage five. Stage one, nothing's going on. Stage five, everything's going on. So stage five, they're like a woman. And stage one, they're like a kid. In between. In between stage two, for the girls, I think of breast budding. For the boys, you think of straight pubic hair. Stage three is what they love to test on is for the girls you're going to have one mount for the boys growth spears and growth of penis stage four girl two mounts and they start the period boys curly hair curly pubic hair so that's how i like to remember it stage one nothing going on stage five everything going on stage three one mount for girls stage four two mount for girls so two plus two is four that's how i remember it stage for the boys stage two straight pubic hair stage four curly pubic hair and stage three is when it's growth of the penis growth spirit etc puberty information so when they get their period that's likely the height that they'll be boys usually start developing sperm around age 13. puberty before eight years old or nine years old for women is abnormal and you want to refer them to endocrinologists Two to three years after they start their puberty, they generally start their period. Delayed puberty, so if they get it too early, you're worried, and if they get it too late. So delayed is after 15 for females, 14 for males. If there's no period, by then you want to refer them to endocrinologists because it needs to be investigated why. Here are pediatric skin conditions that are commonly found. Malia is basically white papules on the nose for the like little white spots, kind of like in the picture, forehead, it's kind of all over like this area over here. Um, they're benign, they go away on its own. Arrhythmia toxicum neonatrum is basically pustules on red basis. They're usually all over like the trunk, the face, extremities, they resolve on their own. Seborrheic dermatitis, which is cradle cap, Everyone knows what cradle cap is, like thick, greasy scales, They're usually on the scallop, and they resolve in a few months. You could use shampoos, but they'll self-limiting. Um, okay, so calf oolat spots are irregular shaped dark brown spots on the skin. If they're more than six, you always want to rule out fibro neurofibromatosis, so that's something you don't want to miss. Hemangioma is a rage ves um, vascular lesion, like in the picture. It resolves on its own, usually by age four. If there's complications, then you can refer them out. Mongolian spots are big, blue, gray. It kind of looks like a bruise a little bit on the back, the lower back, so the lumbar sacral area. 
and more common African Americans or Asians. And what you want to do is you want to document this when they're for newborns because you not think it's abuse. So go into stork bites, so they're light pink patches on the face or usually back of the neck. This is from the stretching of the blood vessels. They could become darker when the baby cries and they blanch. Measles. Measles is something you want to watch out for. Measles is a viral illness, but the reason why it's under um, skin and dermatology is because this has this rash that you see over here. It usually starts out as a red macular papular rash and then it spreads downwards. They also have other symptoms that what is what could clue you in. The copal spots, the small white papules in the cheeks, by the molars, viral, fever, malaise, cough, etc. You want to vaccinate to prevent this. The next one is jaundice. So jaundice is a yellow discoloration of the skin, usually due to a buildup in bilirubin. Within the first 24 hours, it's pathological. So you want to evaluate after 24 hours is physiological, so usually clear as on its own. If the bilirubin is more than 15, that's when they consider phototherapy. Otherwise, just frequently feed the baby and that's a result. The next one is varicella, which is chicken pox. Chicken pox, they usually start out with fever, malaise, sore throat, and then they have a rash. The rash usually causes a lot of itching. That's going to be a clue for you. And it's a lot of vesicle clusters around the body. They're usually in all stages of development. So your key for chicken pox is going to be in all stages of development, little um, clusters of vesicles. This also you want to vaccinate to prevent. So molascum. Molascum, the key way they like to say this is central umbilication. So it's going to be multiple small papules with central umbilication. If it's in the genital area, then you want to be concerned for sexual abuse. So that you want to know. And unfortunately, it could last for like a year, to be honest with you. Scarlet fever, the key one that how they differentiate is a sandpaper rash with a sore throat. They could also have a strawberry tongue and they're going to begin antibiotics. Next, we go on to pediatric eye. So you always want to check for the red reflux. If you see a white color, you want to refer them right away to ophthalmology to rule out retinoblastoma. Okay. Cross eyes with is a strabismus. Both eyes are basically not looking at the same thing. So if they're turning this way, one's eye is turning that way, one's eye is looking straight. You want to refer them to ophthalmology. Within the first two months of the baby's life, it could be normal, but if it's still after that, then you want to rule them out. Next, we go on to tagonococcal ophthalmologic neuronatal. So this is when the mom has gonorrhea and passes it to the baby during birth. In newborns, usually the site that it goes is the eye. So the symptoms are going to be brilliant, discharge, swollen eye, etc. You want to give them erythromycin, which is ophthalmologic ointment, and treatment is subtraction. This you don't want to miss because this could lead to blindness. Okay, so next we go on to a comparison between orbital cellulitis and preceptal cellulitis. Orbital cellulitis is an infection involving the contents of the orbit, while preceptal cellulitis is an infection of the anterior portion of the eyelid. The difference is, is that orbital cellulitis is really serious and they need to go right away to the emergency department while preceptal cellulitis, they could be outpatient on oral antibiotics. The way to differentiate them, because they're both going to have symptoms like eyelid is going to be um, dedimus, so swollen, conjunctival conjunction, congestion, eye pain. The difference is, is that orbital cellulitis has these symptoms while preceptal cellulitis doesn't. So orbital cellulitis has, could have proptosis, vision impairment, pain with eye movement. So those ones you want to check for and those ones you want to refer out to the ED. So next we go on to the pediatric ear. As we all know, acute otitis media is the big one that you should know because that is so common. The symptoms that you're going to see is the bulging, inflamed, red to panic membrane. If it's chronic, you want to worry about hearing loss. They're often preceded by upper respiratory infections first, and then they get an ear infection. Some symptoms are going to be having a fever, tugging of the ear, ear pain. It's because of bacterial. You can either watch or wait, depending, but um, usually we give amoxicillin. 
Otitis externa is external ear infection. The drainage smells really bad, red swelling of the ear, and pain with the movement of the tragus, which is over here. Treatment is going to be olfoxacin drops and analgesic drops. Tepanic membrane rupture is when the ear is all of a sudden hurting, hurting, hurting them, and then they have bloody drainage and relief. Cholesteoma, they like to test on also, is a cauliflower-like growth in the ear. You want to refer them to ENT because they need surgery for that. Next, we go on to musculoskeletal with the pediatrics. So, Salter Harris fracture is when it, um, a fracture occurs on the growth plate. If it's not corrected, it could stunt the child's growth, so you want to diagnose this with an x-ray. Nursemaid's elbow is very common because it's basically an elbow partial dislocation. It's when, you know, two parents are on either side of the kid and they're swinging the kid up by their hand. They're, you know, they're holding their hand and swinging them up, so that causes it to be dislocated. The symptom that the kid will come in with is that the child refused to use that arm. Treatment is going to be close reduction, so you slip the elbow back into place pretty much. If it's effective, the way you'll see it is because the kid will start moving the arm again. Like as opposed to holding it like that, they'll start using the arm. Okay, so again, valrum and valgum. So gum, so valgum, I like to think of gum. So gum makes things stick together. So it's basically knock knees and their feet are sticking together. That resolves usually around age seven. If not, you want to refer them. Oslo's Slatter's disease is knee pain usually from overuse of the knee. So think about, you know, the people who overuse it, the runners, the sports, etc. Treatment for that's going to be NSAIDs, rice, etc. Developmental dysplasia of the hip. So that is basically a hip abnormality, usually in infancy. Risk factors are going to be a lot of stuff for the mom. So breach, a little fluid in pregnancy, family history. It could occur any time in the baby's first year. The symptoms they'll have is the leg length will be unequal, abnormal gait. You want to screen them with the ortholines and Barlow maneuver. If you hear a click, that's abnormal and that you want to think about developmental dysplasia of the hip. This will be referred to pediatric orthopedics if they have that. Next, we go on to scoliosis, which is an abnormal curvature of the spine. You want to test using the Adams forward test, exactly how the name sounds. They stand up, bend forward, like kind of trying to touch your, the hands to their toes. And you want to measure the angle, make sure that the spine is symmetric. If it's more than seven degrees, you want to image them. If it's more than 20 degrees, you want to refer them to ortho for bracing, surgery, whatever they need. Next, we go on to genetic conditions that are common in pediatrics. So Down syndrome is an extra copy of the chromosome 21. So I just think syndrome 21, Down syndrome. And there's no known cause, but there are risk factors like advanced age of the mom. How are you gonna tell that when you see the baby? You have the low set ears, ominized, short neck, poor muscle tone, short height, transverse palm crease. So all those stuff should clue you into that. For Down syndrome patients, you want to know you have to do a cervical spine x-ray before clearing them for sports because you want to make sure it's not unstable. Turner syndrome is when the X chromosome is missing. So obviously it happens in females only. Symptoms are going to be shorter. Web neck is going to be your clue. So complications will be in infertility, puberty. They have other health problems. So you want to refer them to endocrinologists. Marfan syndrome is affects the connective tissue. So the symptoms they're going to they're going to have is the limbs are going to be too long in relation to the rest of the body. So think of like Abraham Lincoln. They're going to be really tall and really thin. The arm span is going to exceed their height. The complications for that is cardiac issues. So you want to refer them to a cardiologist to manage. Them. Okay, next we go on to neurological conditions for pediatric. So the first one is spinal bifida, which is when the neural tube does not close properly. This is generally due to a deficiency in folic acid when the mom was pregnant, but that's why it's not so common now because people are taking prenatals with folic acid. What you would find on a baby would be a sacral dimple or a patch of hair in the lumbar sacral area of the spine. If you do see that, you want to refer them out for imaging. Uh, febrile seizures 
are quite common. There's no long-term damage to them. But if they can't get the fever down, the antipyretics, or the fever is lasting for more than five minutes, or the child is really ill appearing, you want to send them to the ED. Another type of seizure that's common with kids is absent seizures. It's kind of like they're daydreaming for, for less than 10 seconds, so they'll be staring and all of a sudden, like, get back in. Autism. Autism is a huge spectrum with social, developmental issues. Symptoms for eye contact, difficulty interacting with others, not meeting developmental milestones, extremely sensitive to noise, etc. They're going to be screamed at 18 months and 24 months with an MCHAP. Treatment is going to be obviously referring them out for testing and early intervention. Next, we go on to the cardiac system of pediatrics. Coarptation of the aorta. This is a congenital heart defect and the atria is um, too narrow. The, the classic symptom that the tests like to ask for is high blood pressure in arm and lower blood pressure in the legs, obviously managed by cardiologists. Uh, Kakazaki disease they like to ask for also. It's common in children under the age of five. The main symptom is going to be real high fever, strawberry tongue, that's what they're going to ask for on the test and after the fever stops they're going to have peeling of the skin on the hands and feet. The treatment for this is you want to send them to the ED for IV immunoglobulin and aspirin. So This is one of the only times where we actually give a child aspirin when they're sick. This could lead to serious complications, cardiac complications, so they, you do want them to be followed up by cardiologists for a few years. Stills murmur is an innocent murmur, usually between the ages of 2 to 5. It's very low musical sound that's best heard on the left lower sternal border. Next we go on to respiratory for pediatrics. Epiglottitis is a big one. Epiglottitis is inflammation of the epiglottis. It's an emergency because the airway could be completely blocked. What it's caused by is HIB, which is why we vaccinated against it, but it's not so common. But like I said, for the most part, what the tests like to test on, things that are emergencies, even if they're not common, because you can't miss that, and stuff that are really common. So for instance, diabetes, heart, all the stuff, you know, acutitis media, are all the stuff that are so common that are, we see every single day. And then you have your epiglottitis and all these emergencies that we don't see every day, but you still have to know them. They are tested on because it, you can't miss them. They're emergencies. So epiglottitis symptoms that you're going to see, drooling, muffled voice, strider, they're going to be in respiratory distress. So obviously you're going to send them to the ED. So, so nephroblastoma is also called Will's tumor and it's a renal tumor. Symptoms that you're going to find is a small abdominal mass near the flank that does not cross the midline. What you want to know for that is that if you do suspect that, don't palpate it because of could rupture. You want to get an ultrasound right away and refer them out. Next, we go on to RSV. RSV, your typical upper respiratory symptoms, your cough, your fever, your nasal congestion, and it resolves on its own, so no need for antibiotics. Croup, croup how they like to ask for is a barky cough. It also cause strider, fever. Treatment, if they do need it, like if they're strider, etc., is dexamethasone. Pertussis is whooping cough. The reason why it's called whooping cough is because it makes that sound like whoop. Antibiotics could shorten in how long they're contagious for, but pretty much is supportive. And vaccinated against. Sickle cell anemia is under hematology. It's diagnosed by birth because it's part of the newborn screening. It's diagnosed the same way they do for adults, hemoglobin electrophoresis, and you want to watch out for sickle cell crisis. Sickle cell crisis, the main thing they're going to come in with is intense pain, usually caused by dehydration. You want to refer them to the hospital because they need IV hydration and pain meds. Next, we go on to dehydration for GI and GU. Dehydration is quite common because when kids are sick, they don't like to eat, so they just won't eat or drink. If it's severe for a baby, their anterior fontanelles could be sunken, no tears, change in loss of consciousness, rapid pulse, weak, deep breathing, send them to the ED. Um, okay, so these stuff you don't want to miss and you should know. Pyloric stenosis, the main symptom, these have like key symptoms that 
it's going to say in the book or your test, projectile vomiting and olive-shaped mass. Whenever you think of projectile vomiting, olive-shaped mass, you want to think of pyloric stenosis. This is going to be diagnosed with ultrasound, but you want to refer them to the ED because it needs to be surgically corrected. Intussusception. Intussusception is when the bowel kind of telescopes on itself, usually also a very young kid, even infant. Symptoms they're going to be having, the key one that you should know is jelly, mucus-like stool, and sources shaped mass. They also could have like abdominal pain intermittent. This referred to the ED also. Hydrocell is when a, a too much fluid is accumulated around the testes. An infant usually resolves on its own and they don't need surgery. Um, the way you can see this is it transluminates. So you see a larger like glow on the affected side when you shine a light. Encopresis is when they keep having accidents after the right train. Causes could be from chronic constipation, ignoring the urge to go, Treatment, you want to retrain them regular toilet time, at least two times a day, fluids, healthy diet, exercise, stool softeners like Myrolex if needed, and look for an underlying issue. Cryptotidism is basically when the testes are not descended. This is a risk factor for testicular cancer later on. So if someone comes into you and they're telling you their past medical history and they say this, you do want to, you know, think of just, you know, checking them and making sure they don't have testicular cancer. Testicular torsion, we already touched on, but this is also common in kids, so we'll just discuss it here. It's a twisting of the spermatic cord, and what they're gonna come in, sudden onset of testicular pain on one side, they will have no cremastore reflex, and immediately to the ED. Some other pediatric information is that fetal alcohol syndrome, is quite common unfortunately because a lot of people drink how you're going to differentiate them is they're going to have thin upper lips epicanthal folds micro like a small head a flat nasal bridge there's no safe amount of alcohol in pregnancy and it could cause neuro and behavioral problems SIDS is very sad. SIDS is sudden infant death syndrome it's when an infant under 12 months just passes away no known cause um, they can't figure out why. Nothing really explains why. So to prevent, I don't know if this is as much as a prevention, but this is just stuff that you should do to prevent anything happening, you know, that someone can't suffocate themselves. So don't lie them on their stomach, lie them on their back, immunize them, breastfeed, it's always good. Don't co-sleep, don't give them exposure to smoke, don't place pillows or blankets so they can suffocate themselves, and don't overheat them. Leukemia is unfortunately, ALL especially, is common in kids, like two to five. What you want to know is the symptoms because you don't want to miss a diagnosis like this. Symptoms, unexplained we weakness, fatigue, potential bleeding, and bleeding. So, for instance, if they constantly have nosebleeds, you want to rule that out and refer them out. Ray syndrome is when someone has a viral illness and takes aspirin. This is a condition that causes swelling of the the liver and the brain. So to prevent this, you want to avoid aspirin when you're immunizing someone or viral illness, you want to avoid giving them aspirin, so give them Tylenol, ibuprofen instead. If this does happen, send them to the ED right away because it's a high mortality rate. Head lice is common in kids also. Symptoms, very itchy scalp. Diagnose, you'll see the nits. So when do we not need a parent's consent? So for treatment for STDs, even if it's under 18, don't need a parent's consent. Contraceptive, and diagnosis and management of a pregnant person under 18, you don't need a parent's consent. Things that you have to report. You have to report GCW, so a gunshot wound, child abuse, SI, HI, etc. Tylenol poisoning is quite common because everyone has it around and that's what they have accessible. You want to measure the levels between 4 and 24 hours after ingestion and refer them to the ED. The antidote to reverse that would be um, acetylcysteine. Failure to thrive is diagnosed, like we said before, below the fifth percentile, or if they go two major growth percentiles down, and usually because they're just not eating enough. Uh, child abuse, the key thing that you'll see from that is various stages of healing. So you'll see bruises in various stages of healing, or just injuries are not consistent with the report or just inconsistent um, reports, like mom saying this, dad saying this, someone else saying this. Unfortunately, parents or close contacts are the most 
common abusers. You're required to report that and it's better safe than sorry. So better that you're wrong than you miss and it's unsafe for the kid. Professional role, you have your hierarchy of evidence. This they always love to test on. They like to have little boxes and you know scenarios, and you pick which one goes on top, which one the stroke the strongest evidence, which one's the weakest. So the strongest component is your meta-analysis and your systemic review. And what this is is basically where they pull several studies together that's already been done. Then the way I like to meta Remember the middle is all your C's. You have controlled, cohort, case control, cross-sectional. If you see any of these keywords, remember it's the middle one. And that's where actual research is being performed. Then you have your observational study, which is just opinions. It's longitudinal, res retrospective, just opinions. There's no real research. So just remember those three. First, meta-analysis, systemic review, which is actual research that was already done. You're pulling them all together. Number three is all the C's. We're then doing research now. Number I'm sorry, number two was all the C's we're doing research now. Number three is your observational studies, just opinions. And next we go on to the health belief model. It's basically saying that people are not going to change their health unless they believe six parts. So six parts are, you know, you have different stuff coming together to make them. So your perceived risk susceptibility, belief of consequences, risk of severity, benefits to action, self-efficacy, and cues to action. What it's basically saying is that, for instance, if they don't think that drinking alcohol is much of a risk to their body, they'll keep drinking it. If they don't see any benefit in quitting. If they don't think that they're the one who's going to get the virus or whatever it is, they're not going to do the prevention. Next, we go on to the stages of change model, which is basically assessing the patient's readiness to make a change. You have your pre-contemplation, which is before they're even, you know, want to quit, contemplation, and then you have your preparation where they're actually taking small steps to quit. For instance, cutting back on cigarette packs, etc. Then you have your action and your maintenance. So your pre-contemplation, contemplation, preparation, action, and maintenance. Next, we go on to the family system theory, which is basically saying that the family functions as a cohort, cohesive unit. Each member plays a role. So if one slacks, the next one has to pick up to make up for that. Next, we go on to Lewin change model, and that's three steps. So, so like a change model, let's say number one is unfreeze before the change occurs, change, and then refreeze, which is basically making sure you don't relapse. Transition care model is to prevent re-emissions and exacerbation. So it's a lot of like discharge planning, case management, especially for patients with COPD, congestive heart failure that generally will go into exacerbations. You have your Swiss cheese model, which is basically when errors occur, they go back and they see where it occur, how, what, and everything like that to make sure it doesn't occur again. And you have all your acts and boards. So your State Nursing Practice Act is endorsed by the State Board of Nursing. And what they do is that they determine the legal right to practice as a nurse practitioner and determines the scope of practice. So that's important to know. You have your Affordable Care Act, which is done to help people um, get insured. So, for instance, it allows you to stay till you're 26 under your parents' insurance. You can't refuse people with pre-existing conditions, etc. Then you have your COBRA, which gives coverage to people like in between their jobs, pretty much. So, if you lose your job, you could pay your company to stay on until you find a new one. And you have managed care. So managed care is two different things, PPO and HMO. HMO is basically you have to pick your own doctor and you need a referral in order to go to a specialist. PPO, you don't need a referral and you don't have to pick one doctor. So next we have the Budget Reconciliation Act, which allows nurse practitioners to be reimbursed by Medicare. High tech is basically promotes electronic use and fines you if you don't use electronic like the EMR. So for instance, if you do paper charts, you get fined. Institutional Review Board, as you know this, they review and monitor research so they protect the subject's participations. You have reviews, the gold standard database, which is um, systemic reviews, like we said before, is the top of the line. So that's the conjuring review. You have your Medline, which is a database of a lot of journal articles, PubMed, which is um, part of Medline, but they have a lot of science abstracts. Sinahal, which is a lot of nursing and allied health 
journals. Um, consensus, consensus model for APN allows nurse practitioners to practice to the fullest extent of what they're certified to do. Next, we go on to Medicare that's for 65 years old and up or people with end stage renal disease, etc. This is funded by a federal level, so they like to ask if it's funded by the state or federal. So Medicare is funded by the federal, Medicaid is funded at a state and federal level. So like we said, Medicare, you want to care for the elderly, so it's for the elderly and disabled. Um, there are different parts they like to ask in this also. You have A, B, C, and D. A is all your inpatient stuff. So, you know, just like how I like to think about it is A is where is like the A plus where you could do like MRIs and everything in the hospital. So it's going to be all your inpatient stuff. Hospital. It also includes um, hospice and nursing homes. B is all your outpatient. So if you can't get to the hospital or you don't want to go there, step B, go outpatient. So that includes your labs, dialysis, screenings, ambulance, etc. C is advantage plan. So like all the extras. How I like to think about it, like your supplemental plan, dental, vision, all the extras. And D is D for drug. So D is your drug coverage, so your prescriptions. So A is all, in all inpatient, B is all outpatient, C is all the extras, like dental, vision, and D is your drugs. Medicaid is for your low income and disabled also. Like I just said, it's funded at a federal and state level. Um, to be eligible, you need to fit the criteria of amount of money to make. Some programs they have on there would be WIC, Food for Women, Children, etc. Then we have the levels of prevention, the institution also primary, secondary, tertiary. So primary is to prevent before incidents occur. Secondary is screening. So we only screen if someone's like at risk for it. So that would be, so SS, secondary screening. And tertiary is after it happens. So for instance, they already got in a car accident. So rehab treatment. To prevent that before the incident occur, seatbelts would be your primary. Statistics, just the leading cause of death is heart disease, cancer, and accidents. And then we go, the leading cause death by age. So the reason why this is important to know is because anticipatory guidance. The top cancers that do cause death are lung, breast, and colon. So they're not necessarily the most common, they're just the top that cause death. Here are some terms that you have to know, um, just ethical terms. Beneficence is do good. Examples are help patients, do what's best for the patient's interest, not yours, so educate them. Non-maleficence is do no harm. So don't prescribe them stuff if you know it's going to have bad side effects for them. Um, Utilitarianism is the greatest good for the greatest number. Justice, you want to be fair for everyone, you want to treat everyone the same regardless if they're poor, rich, etc. Fidelity, trust, keep your promise if you make one to the patient. Autonomy, the patient has the right to make the decisions. If they don't want surgery and you think they're crazy, that's their decision and you got to respect that. Accountability is that you're held responsible, so if you make an error, it's your responsibility. Veracity is honest, be truthful, tell them the bad side effects, not just, you know, only the good. Uh, paternalism is protecting them from harming themselves. So for instance, that you decide what is best for them because you disagree with what they choose. Um, other terms that you have to know, just non-ethical terms, just regular terms. Living will is a document that says what the patient's prefer regardless of the health care if they can't make decisions, so DNR, DNI. Healthcare power of attorney, it's a person who's designated that can make their decisions if the person can't, only if they can't. Power of attorney, it's a document that designs someone to make the decisions for them. So the living will is just a document that says, you know, DNR, DNI, what they want after. And um, healthcare power of attorney is the person who's going to be making their decisions when they can't. And the power of attorney is a document that designates someone to make the decisions for them. Risk management is basically the people who try to identify risky things to prevent adverse patient outcomes. The Joint Commission, we all know that, they give accreditation to hospitals, nursing homes, etc. So an intel event is an event that ends up with severe harm, like death, and you need to do root cause analysis to make improvements so that doesn't happen. Root cause analysis is identifying what causes the error, you know, to prevent it from happening next time. The plaintiff 
is the patient or someone acting for the patient. The defendant is usually the nurse practitioner or the hospital. NPR numbers are your unique number that you're going to be giving. It's issued by the NPBS and you need it in order to bill. So here are just some more terms. Incense to bill is when the patient is seen by the physician first, the physician writes a care plan, and then the nurse practitioner sees the patient after. So for that reason, the nurse practitioner could bill um, at 100% because usually when nurse practitioners bill, they bill at 85%. So over here, if, the, if you're kind of just like following up with the patient, then you could bill at 100%. ICD-10 codes are identifying the diagnosis. CPT codes are saying any medical procedure done during the visit. The Belmont report, it says ethical rules must be followed when doing research. Emancipated minor is someone, they're under 18 years old, but they don't need a, like parent consent or anything. So this is someone who is active military duty, legally binding marriage, or a legal court documents saying that the minor is an emancipated minor. Cohort is a group of people that share something in common. Um, Cross-sectional studies compares different and similarities between the groups. Experimental is, is randomization with subject selection. Quasi-experimental studies that evaluates interventions that do not use randomization. Someone thing could be inductive or deductive. Inductive is from specific topic to general. It's used in Qualitative deductive is starting from a theory and then narrowing it down. So it's kind of like the opposite, it's using quantitative. Qualitative studies are all those words and quantitative is, is the numbers, measurable stuff. Then we go on to our active versus passive immunity. Active immunity is through vaccinations or infection and passive is through like it's passed on through antibody infusions, breastfeeding, etc. If something's horizontally transmitted, it's spread from one person to the next. If something's vertically transmitted from mom to infant. Infant mortality is the number of infants death per 100,000 live births. Sensitivity versus specificity. So sensitivity is the ability of screening tests to identify persons with a disease, while specificity is the ability of screening tests to identify persons without the disease. Um, some other stuff you should know under professional role is nurse practitioners are required to be licensed. Certifications are optional, and I'm saying most people, most places do require you, but technically it's optional. You could collaborate with three different people. You could collaborate with doctors, so MDs, DOs, dentists, or dental surgeons. Schedule II control medications cannot be called in. They need to be signed by paper. We mentioned that before. You're required to have tamper-resistant prescription pads, and malpractice insurance could be claim-based or occurrence-based. So claim-based is when you have coverage while you're in the hospital, while you're employed, but once you leave that job, you don't have coverage anymore. If you do claims-based, so if the patient comes back and you're no longer employed there, then you have no coverage, unless you do tail coverage. But occurrence base is by occurrence, so it's not affected by, you know, if you change jobs or not, as long as you're covered when that occurrence happened, you're good. Telehealth versus telemedicine. So telehealth is a clinical service and non-clinical service, and telemedicine is a subset of telehealth, but it's only clinical service. Vulnerable populations include someone under 18, so children, pregnant women, prisoners, refugees, ethnic minority, mental or physical disability, visual hearing impairment, and economically disadvantaged. When you have your independent variable and your, and your dependent variable. Independent variable is a thing that you're manipulating and dependent variable is what happens from what you manipulated. Hypothesis is the idea. No hypothesis is the opposite. So something cannot, whatever. You have different types of studies. You have your prospective, retrospective, and your longitudinal. The prospective is on future thing, retrospective is on stuff that already occurred, and a longitudinal is you're following a group of people for a long time. Research process, you have your conception, which is coming up with the hypothesis, so the idea, the research question. You have your design, your planning, you're selecting the research design, methods, protocols, you're submitting it, implementation, analysis, and this 
documentation, which is preparing the final report. These are the following scenarios where you do not need consent HIPAA-wise. When you contact insurance companies, contact a third party that's hired to help with payment, audits, medical service reviews, collection agencies, report, reporting like abuse or neglect, or if you're consulting with another healthcare provider. Some other HIPAA stuff that you should know, if you put in a sign sheet, it should not have like a diagnosis. You have to call the patients in the waiting room by the first name only. And if you're making voice message, you want to tell them to call you back. Don't say it in the voice message because they can have someone near them who they don't want to hear what they have. Some other HIPAA stuff is that emancipated minor could sign their own documents. Some other stuff that you should know about cultural considerations. So African Americans, a lot of times will do religious coping. Hindu, they believe that the illness is karma. They accept the pain. They don't like treatment. And they have a lot of fasts. Muslims, the female modesty, so they might want to be seen by a female provider. Women usually needs a male permission to go see a doctor, and the woman has to be with another person if seen by a male provider. They could refuse to be undressed, so you, you could do a modified exam for them. And during the Ramadan fast, they fast for a lot of days only during the daytime, so you want to give them, you know, like tell them do the oral meds at sunset, etc. If they're Jewish, they generally prefer the same gender also as a provider. Um, they can't work on the Sabbath, so, you know, electronics, etc. You want to help them shut off the light if they need, and they have a kosher diet. Jehovah's Witness, they don't donate or accept blood, but they do accept non-blood plasma expanders and blood components. Latinos, Hispanics, the mom plays a huge role. They believe in folk healers. They believe in the evil eye that comes if someone um, envies their children, and they believe that it could be broken if someone touches their children. For them, the extended family is very important. And they could have multiple generations living in one home. Asians are very respectful for doctors and education. They don't question um, and they value their elder. So you want to really explain and ask them, do you understand? Because they might not question you, but they might not understand. For Chinese, a lot of times they'll believe in the, the distribution between ying, yang, so ying is a female, yang is a male. They also do cupping. So if you see bruises on the back you, or coining, it's not necessarily abuse. And the woman generally avoids stuff cold for one month after birth. And that's pretty much it for professional health. Okay, now we're going to go on to the medication. So in general, with every medication, you don't want to be starting them on multiple medications at once because you're not going to know which one is causing which side effect. So you want to start one medication, trial it. If you need increase the dose, decrease the dose, change the medication after that. With medication, we have the Beer's criteria, and that's basically a list of medications that should be avoided in the elderly because of the side effects, like let's just say hypotension. Some drugs that are mentioned, there's a whole list of them, but a lot of them are like Benadryl, sedatives, antipsychotics, tramadol, opioids. Those are just to name a few. Now we go on to specific uh, classes of medication. So first we talk about cardiac. Under cardiac, we have our antihypertensive. So before prescribing any antihypertensive, in order to actually diagnose someone with hypertension, you need two different readings at two different times. So if they come into your office and they're hypertensive, it doesn't mean that they need antihypertensive. You have to tell them either to go home or come back the next time. And then you have two different readings at two different times. So you tell them to do a blood pressure diary and then you could diagnose them. So. So over here is just like a chart of what's normal, elevated, stage one, stage two, etc. The first line for anybody with antihypertensive is your ACE, your ARBs, your castle channing blockers, or your thiazide diuretic. If someone's African American, they generally prefer calcium channel blockers or the thiazide diuretic. If you have um, only systolic hypertension in the elderly, then generally we'll go for the low dose thiazide or the calcium channel blockers. Okay, now we go on to each of the categories. So the ACE inhibitors, those all end in pro. Examples, uh, ramipril, enalapril, etc. So those are really good for people with renal issues, diabetic issues, heart issues, because it's cardioprotective and renal protective. So a lot of patients who come in with antihypertensive with hypertension have renal issues, so this is great for them, which is why it's one of the first line. 
the main side effect that they're going to question that they're going to test you on is dry hacking cough. So if this happens, you want to switch them to an ARB. Other side effects that you should know about the ACE is the hyperkalemia and the angioedema. So just think ACE inhibitors, the dry hacking cough, hyperkalemia, and angioedema. So of course, because of hyperkalemia, you want to monitor the renal function. And ACE inhibitors are one of the stuff that we discussed before that are tetragenic that you do not want to give to pregnant women. Or category X, you don't want to give it to pregnant women. ARBs, ARBs are, um, they all end in sartan, so losartan, valsartan. And the thing with ARBs is that it's basically, it's very much like ACE inhibitors. So it's the same side effects. The only thing is that much less with a dry hacking cough. So if someone does have dry hacking cough, you can switch them to ARBs. Then we go into calcium channel blockers. That's also another first line for antihypertensive. Um, it could also be used for different arrhythmias because it dilates the coronary arteries. There are two different types. You have ones that do not affect the heart conduction and ones that do. So the ones that do not all end in dipine, so amlodipine, nicardipine, and the ones that, that do are diltiazem, rapamil. Side effects, they could lead to um, AV box, bradycardia, etc. So you wanna watch out which patients you're giving this to. Next, we go on to the thighs high diuretic. And these have a cross allergy to sulfur drugs. So if someone's was to them, then don't give it to this. This is great for osteoporosis because it reduces the calcium excretion and it stimulates osteoblasts. So these are really good for someone with osteoporosis. They're really good, like we said before, for African Americans. And they're also first line medication. They're not good for high triglycerides, uric acid, high glucose, and lithium because it increases both of them. So if any of your patients have that, then you don't want to give them that. Next, we go on to beta blockers. So beta blockers are not first line. Like we just said, the first line are the ACE, ARBs, calcium channel blockers, and thiazide. So because those are first lines, those are generally going to be tested on the most. But we could just discuss the other ones because you might have to know that. So they all end in lull. You have two different types for that also. You have the cardioselective and the non selective. So cardioselective are atenolol, metoprolol, and non-cardioselective are the propanolol and the cradolol. So what I mean by non-cardioselective is that it not only it works on the lungs and the heart. So if someone has asthma, COPD, any really lung condition, you don't want to give them that one. A beta blockers, besides for antihypertensive, they could actually also be used for migraines. They're used a lot of times for prophylactics for, for migraines. And one of the things that you want to know about that is that they can mask the symptoms of hypoglycemia. So if you have a diabetic patient, you might not want to give them a beta blocker because you might not know if they're going hypoglycemic. One major side effect is erectile dysfunction, which is why a lot of people are not compliant. There are there are three different antihypertensive medications that could be given in pregnancy: methyldopa, labetalol, and nifedipine. So people like to remember this mnemonic, like new little mom. So nifedipine is new, labetalol is little, and mom is methyldopa. So those are three antihypertensives that you could give in pregnancy. So next we go into other medications that could be used for hypertensive, but also could be used for other stuff. So first we have our loop diuretics, which is um, your Lasix, with furosemide, you have Ibumex. That's actually a really strong diuretic, which is why it's great for, uh, for heart failure patients. Some side effects are anytime you're going to flush the system out. So basically, you know, they're going to keep peeing out. You want to watch out for electrolyte imbalances, hypotensive. Um, any medication that you're giving for hypertension, it could have the opposite effects, so it could go hypertensive also. You also want to watch out for hypokalemia, and they're also ototoxic. They could be ototoxic. Potassium sparing diuretics are, you know, they do the same thing, make them pee a lot, but they're much more milder. Side effects are hyperkalemia uh, because they're keeping in the potassium and gynecomastia. Uh, next, we go on to the alpha blockers. So these are vasodilators, which is great for hypertension. Um, they all end in zosin, terazosin, doxazosin. One major side effect is orthostatic hypertension, which is really common in the first dose. So anytime you have a side effect of orth orthostatic hypertension, you want to tell them to take it right before bedtime. Then we go on to nitrates 
And nitrates are really good for for chest pain side effect. It's hypotensive. Like we said, that's for all of them. Um, it's usually given, you know, at home. If if chest pain goes away, then it's good. But um, if it doesn't after three times, you want to call, send them over. The Jackson. So that's actually a used to be a fairly common medication. It used to be first line for hypertensive, but now they're not. Now the Arnie's are, which we'll discuss in a few minutes. Um, one of the reasons why not is because it has a really narrow therapeutic range of like 0.5 to 2, and if it's more than that, it's toxicity. Symptoms of toxicity that you should know because a lot of people are still on it. Visual changes, so like green, yellow halos, bradycardia, fatigue, etc. You have your anecdote which is Gibran. Next we go on to the antiarrhythmias. So, so in general, you know, it's a family practice. So you're not really going to be prescribing this. This can be managed by a cardiologist. But one of them you should be familiar with is, is amiodarone, which is for AFib and ventricular arrhythmias. And the reason why, because you should realize that it interacts with a lot of like anticoagulants, etc. Hyperlipidemia. So this is pretty common, especially due to people's diets. And your first line is going to be the ones that end in the statins. These, they decrease the LDL and they increase the HDL. You have your high intensity, so it goes according to dose. It's torvastatin, rubastatin, you know, basically at higher doses. Before you want to start your patient on this, you want to check their baseline liver functions and get a baseline of what the muscle pain is because one of the side effects that you want to watch out for is rhabdomyolysis. And one of the symptoms for that is muscle pain, dark urine, etc. So you have to know what their baseline is before they're going to come in and say they have back pain. You're going to be like, it's due to the medication, but this could be something they always live with. And of course, check their liver. Another class for the hyperlipidemia is the fibrates. Um, this, an example of this is the phenofibrates. These decrease the triglycerides and increase the HDL. If triglycerides are more than 500, the patient's at risk for acute pancreatitis. So they like to ask that also. If it's more than 500 triglycerides, you always want to rule out pancreatitis. Okay, next we go on to our anticoagulants. So these are a lot. A lot of people are on it because for AFib, for DVT, for PE, there's many reasons why um, they're given. So your first line is your oral ones, only because you don't need direct monitoring, you don't need labs every so often. But if the patient has like valve, valve diseases, prosthetic heart valves, etc., then you might have to use warfarin or something else. So the oral anticoagulants include the direct uh, thrombin inhibitors, the factor XA inhibitors, cumarins, and then, and then of course you have your warfarin and your heparin. So your warfarin, you have to monitor the PT INR. You have to know what a normal INR is, so it's one. If they're on warfarin, the INR should be higher because you want the blood to be thinner. So it should be around 2 to 3. If they have heart valve issues, then the INR should be 2.5 to 3.5. So that's something that you should know and just pretty much memorize. So you want to stop that five days before surgery because you don't want them to bleed out when they're having surgery. What you should know about warfarin interacts with a lot of medications, like almost every medication. Antidote is vitamin K. This is a category X in pregnancy, so obviously this is not given in pregnancy. Um, usually this patient would be referred to a cardiologist for monitoring. You know, there's a lot of labs that have to be done, etc. So next we go on to our, our antiplatelets and the difference between antiplatelets, anticoagulants, and, an, and the thrombolytics. So anticoagulants, they thin the blood so the body can't make clots. Antiplatelets are to stop the platelets from forming. So they stop them from clumping together to make clots. And the thrombolytics are to dissolve clots that are already there. So if you have a clot that's already there, you're not giving your anticoagulants, you're not giving your antiplatelets, you're giving the thrombolytics. Other medications that you should know that increase the risk of bleeding, so you also want to take, you know, stop taking them before surgery, and if you're on warfarin or whatever, don't be taking this. NSAIDs, aspirin, ginkgo biloba, uh, garlic, and fever fuel. Um, okay, so next we go on to our dermatology. 
in terms of medication. A lot of antibiotics in terms of, you know, skin conditions and dermatology, but that's under the antibiotic section. So we have our topical steroids. They go from very potent, which is class one, which you don't want to be prescribing, you know, leave that to a dermatologist, to class seven, which is the least potent. So like I said, you never want to prescribe a class one. It could cause adrenal insufficiency. If it's on like the face or the genital area, you want to use the lowest potency because it's very sensitive skin and they absorb much more of the steroid. You should never give, you should never get someone a steroid if you suspect a fungal infection because it can make the fungal infection worse. And it's best if you apply any cream for that matter, three minutes after, like after you're in a bath or what. So mepiracin is an antibiotics. It's used very often, especially for empatigo. That's like the main cause of why someone use it for non-bolus empatigo. Um, antivirals are for viruses like herpes, shingles, etc. Acyclovir is the most commonly used and it's the cheapest, pretty much. You have your antifungals, which are used for ringworm, pinworm, terbenafine is one of them. You have your permethrin, which is used for lice and scabies. For scabies, what we want to tell them to do is place it on the entire body from the neck down, and they should wash it 12 hours and repeat that in a whole week. For lice, you want them to apply it for their head. It kills the active lice, but doesn't unhash eggs, so you don't need like a secondary treatment. If someone has acne, the first line is benzoyl peroxide for model, like mild one. Um, your last resort is Accutane, but that's never going to be given in primary care. That's going to be done by a dermatologist. Lidocaine. So lidocaine is used quite often, especially to suture. You want to know that you do not want to use epinephrine on areas that have a high risk for ischemia, like for instance, the fingers, the tip of the nose, the toes, ears, etc. Next we go on to medications for neuro. So when we talk about medications for neuro, seizures are the most common ones. You have a whole bunch of them. Valproic acid is quite common. It's used to treat and prevent seizures. There's a very narrow therapeutic range, 50 to 100, and so you want to make sure they're not toxic. This is not given in pregnancy at all. Some side effects are weight gain, hair loss, and it's toxic to the liver. Um, uh, next we have Dilantin, side effects for that is the teeth, they could like discolor, gingival hyperplasia, and then we have the Tegodol. Now we go on to medications for migraines. So you have some medications that prevent migraines and you have some medications that treat acute migraines. So we discussed all that before, but we're just going to be talking about the triptans. So triptan, for instance, a sumatriptan is best for abortive therapy for the migraines. These medications, they don't really work like each other. So if one medication didn't work for you, then you could switch to another one. You don't have to switch to a whole different class of medications. You should know who you who you cannot give this to, so it's contraindicated in people with uncontrolled hypertensive taking MAOI or coronary artery disease. You want them to take this as soon as their headache begins, not when it's like full blown. This is not um, an acute treatment, it's more like of an abortive treatment. So next we go on to Parkinson medication. So this is when, so Parkinson in general is when there's not enough of the dopamine. So you want to give them back dopamine pretty much. You're going to give them the levodopa carbidopa. That's the most common. What you should know about that medication is that you have the wearing off, wearing off phenomenon. So usually within like five years of them being with it, they usually have the Parkinson symptoms again, even though the medication is appropriate, the dose is good, and all of a sudden they'll restart. So that's why it's like the first thing that you'd want to jump to because of that wearing off phenomenon. So you try to like prolong it with other stuff. Melchizine you should know about. That's usually you'd use for someone with BPBV and it'll last in the body for quite a while. For anemia, so if someone is, has iron deficiency anemias, obviously you want to replace their iron. It's usually given for like five to six months and you want to monitor them with labs, remind them to take iron on an empty stomach, it interferes a lot. And you also want to remind them that if they take iron, then they could have black stool that is normal for someone taking iron.
One more thing about iron that you want to know about, given to the kids, you want to give it in a dropper because it could stain the teeth. So now we go on to psychiatric medication. So you have like a whole list of medications for depression. There's SSRIs, SNRIs, TCAs, etc. Your SSRIs are your first line for depression. They're also used for anxiety, OCD, PTSD. They're first line for a lot of stuff. So you really should know this because they're used quite often. One of the main side effects while people stop it is weight gain and sexual dysfunction. So you want to, you know, follow up with them, make sure they're taking it, etc. And also another thing is with a lot of these antidepressants, anti-anxieties, is that it takes a while to work. It can take up to like four weeks to work. So a lot of times they'll try it after a week, it's not working, and then they'll say it's not working and they'll stop taking it. So you want to let them know it could take some time. So some examples are your Paxil, your Lexapro, your Zoloft. Those are all examples of SSRIs. What you want to know for any antidepressant that when you're starting a new antidepressant, depressed and they're at risk for suicidal ideation. So you want to watch out for that. You always want to ask someone who's depressed any thoughts of harming themselves, any plan, etc. And a lot of these medications for psych or mental health, they cause an increase in weight gain. Your SNRIs, you want to know that they're not good for someone with hypertension. Some examples are Effexor, Cymbalta. Your TCAs, that they could slow down the cardiac conduction. So you always want to get an EKG before starting, and it's not really good for a cardiac patient. They are also used for people who have acne. Not the first line, but they could be used. Your MAOIs, what you want to know for that is that you want to avoid foods that are high in tyramine because they could cause a hypertensive crisis. And they interfere with like almost everything. Grapefruit juice, they interfere with other antidepressants, they interfere with like a lot of medications. Your atypical antipsychotics, so your Seroquel, uh, Risperidol, Zyprexa, they all could cause weight gain, hyperlipidemia, increased blood sugar. So if you have diabetes or metabolic syndrome, that's not the patient you want to put them on. Um, it goes together in St. John's Wort. It's an herb, interferes with a lot of medications, but it is used for depression. For anxiety, you could also give them benzodiazepines. It's not your first line. You don't want to be using it for a long time because it could become dependent on it. Lithium is a medication used for bipolar. It takes a few weeks for it to work, and there's a really, really narrow therapeutic range. It's like 0.6 to 1.2, and more than 2 is toxic. You don't want to have any fr fruit juice, like grapefruit juice on it and it is not given in pregnancy, and you always want to make sure that they're not having side effects of toxicity. Um, next, we go on to respiratory medications. So in terms of COPD and asthma, the stepwise approach is in the respiratory section, which we already discussed. But your SABA, so your short-acting beta gonergic, like your albuterol, levobuterol, they all have the name albuterol in it. They affect in minutes, which is why it's like a rescue inhaler. If the symptoms don't improve, you obviously want to follow up. And then you have your long-acting beta agonist ones. Um, they all end in pteridols. They take a while to work, and they linger around for longer, which is why they use long-term. Okay, now we go on to antibiotics for pneumonia. If they're a healthy person, you can use your doxycycline, your macro. It's like azithromycin, moxicillin. If they have comorbidities or they are were on antibiotics in the past 90 days, then you want to use your fluoroquinolones, like levoquin, etc., or your macrolides, like augmentin uh, combination. Some other respiratory medications, your you know your upper respiratory infections. You could do your decongestions are usually first line. You do not want to give someone a decongestion if they have hypertensive because it causes vasoconstriction, so that increases the blood pressure. There's also a phenomenon known as rhinitis medica like medicanalysia, which is basically rebound congestion. So if you take the decongestions for more than three days, you have the potential to become dependent on it. So you want to tell them to take it very short, and if they have hypertension, don't give it to them. You have your expectorants, which help people get out phlegm from their chest, so you have your mucinex for that. You want to keep telling them to keep drinking. Um, this is all for like acute. This is, not some, this is not something you want your patient to be on chronically. This is just like, you know, to help them for their symptoms. Um, you have your anti which is basically for cough. 
someone keeps coughing. In general, you don't really want to suppress a cough. Um, you know, it's there to help them get out, like, whatever they have in them, mucus, etc. But if they do want something, you know, because they're at work or whatever, they need it for a day, then you give them medications. You don't want to give them the narcotic one, like the codeine. You have the non-narcotic one, the dextromethorphan, to give them. For your allergic rhinitis medications, your first line are your intranasal corticosteroids. Your second line are your antihistamines. So next we're going to go on to the endocrine medications. So endocrine, the main one is your diabetes. So there are millions of diabetic medications. It's like the new thing out there. Unfortunately, almost everyone has diabetes because of what we eat and our lifestyle. So there are tons and tons and tons of different classes. I'm going to be discussing the main ones and what you should know. So you have your metformin. That's a big one. Metformin, the main side effect you want to watch out for is GI. I would know everything under metformin because this is this is the one that you want to start with and you want to max it out before you go to something else. Your main side effect is your GI, your max dose, you should know about that. Benefits about metformin versus other stuff is number one, it doesn't cause hypo hypoglycemia. So like in general, the same thing as the antihypertensives, when you give someone medication, it goes the opposite way, but it could go too much the opposite way. So the same way over here, you're giving someone an anti-diabetic medication, you don't want them to go hypoglycemic. So metformin is one of those medications that do not cause that. It also is weight neutral because a lot of these diabetic medications cause people to gain weight. So that's pretty much why it's used a lot and you want to max it out. It, um, you also want to monitor the renal function for this. You do not want to be giving it to them if the GFR is under 50. You also want to stop them before they're going to procedures with dye because that also affects the kidneys. The long-term side effect that you want to watch out for with metformin because a lot of people are in the long term are B12 deficiency. Uh, metformin could also be used to treat other conditions like PCOS because of insulin resistance the same way over here. The GLP-1 agonist ones, those are injections, but those are cardioprotective, so that's why they're good for your certain patients. Your SGLT2 inhibitors are also cardioprotective, so they're good, and they're oral, as opposed to your GLP-1, which is injection. So, like this, I have like a whole paper on, you can check above or below to the link to that, but we won't be discussing for this, but for this slide, just really know about the metformin and everything about that. So here's a chart on your insulin, like like the peak, the onset, how long they last for, etc. Rapid ones cover from the meal itself. The regular insulin covers from one meal to the next. And pH covers from the morning, breakfast till dinner, and Lantus covers the whole day, pretty much. Some alternatives to, you know, the other page we discussed, the first line medications, and some alternatives are the sulfonylureas. They really cause hypoglycemic, so you really want to avoid them in the elderly especially, but they can be used if needed. TCDs, side effects is that it's toxic to the liver, heart, they cause weight gain and edema, so it's really not first line. And, okay, so now we go on to our thyroid. So hypothyroid is quite common, so you should know this, everything about this also. You're going to be giving Synthroid levothyroxine synthroid to people who are hypothyroidism. You want to start them at 25 to 50 mcgs orally every day, usually given in the morning before they eat anything else because it interacts with a lot of different stuff. What you should be know, know about this is that it takes like four to six weeks pretty much to see improvements. So you want to do lab work after four to six weeks of starting it. It increases the risk of osteoporosis, so you do want to watch out for that. Your hyperthyroidism, which is not as common, um, your first line is your radioactive iodine, second line is taking out the thyroid. The third line is medications like PTU and Tapazole. The difference between PTU and Tapazole, so PTU you have to take several times a day, frequent labs draws like CBC because they could cause agranulocytosis. So that's why they're really not really used because people don't want to be stuck a lot of times and people are going to forget to take it a few times. So tapazole is only once a day. But PTU is the one that's given the first trimester. After the first trimester of pregnancy, you could use your tapazole. 
Next, we go on to Addison's disease. So for them, you, they always should have an emergency kit of steroids in case they go into Addisonian crisis. You never want to stop any steroids abruptly, and there's a lot of long-term issues like hyperglycemia, immune system issues, agitation, osteoporosis, personality changes. So you really don't want to be putting someone on any steroids long-term. Next, we go on to medications for the stomach, the GI system. So your first line for GERD, which is quite common, is your PPIs. So pentoprazole, everything that ends in prazole. You always want to take these before meal. And long term, they could cause B12 deficiency, osteoporosis. So you do want to watch out for that. Some other medications that you could be taking for GERD is your H2 receptor blockers, so famotidine, but these are not first line, but they're cheaper, so a lot of times they are used, but they're not as strong as a PPI. But they are first line for GERD also. For antacids, you have your Tums. They're over the counter, but that's really just for symptom relief. It's kind of just like a band-aid, so it's really not first line. Your first line is your H2 receptors and your PPIs. First line for duodenal ulcers are your sulcophage. You want to take that before meals. And what it does is that it coats the stomach lining to protect your ulcers. Then we have medication for nausea. What is used most is your Zofran. And what you want to watch out for that is a QT prolongation. So Zofran QT prolongation. Next we go on to stuff for the bowel movement. So doxusate is something that is used to help people, you know, if they're constipated, especially the elderly, um, especially people who are on o opioids cause constipation. And what it does is that it brings fluid into the stool and it makes it softer and easier to pass. It's usually used long term, like in the elderly, because it causes minimal side effects. You have your bulk laxatives that you could use, your metamucil. You always want to take any of these with a glass of water and you have your lactulose. That's primarily for people with cirrhosis because they can't remove the ammonia from their system. So it pulls ammonia into the stool and it removes it from the body. Antidiarrhea is not really that commonly used, but if it's more than three days, then you could use Imodium, um, but you really don't wanna use, try to use that. Next, we go on to our GU medications. So when we talk about reproduction, you have your estrogen, progesterone. We already went through this, all these medications in the contraceptive part, what is contraindicated, but you really have to know what it's contraindicated in because I like to test on that. Anything with clots, pretty much migraines with aura, someone who's over 35 and smokes, uncontrolled hypertension, someone who's breastfeeding, etc. So I would really know like all this, but we already went through this before, you know, what should what to do if they forget it, when to start it, advantages, disadvantages, etc. Your progesterone only, we also went through this, are for people who are who are breastfeeding or people with cancer, people who estrogen is contraindicated for. Your IUDs, it's they're great because they're kept in for years, but you need to do a baseline pelvic exam, pap smear, SAD screening before inserting them. Some side effects is that they can have amenorrhea, which means not having the period, which could be great for them, like people like that, which is why they do use the IUD. But some people could have the opposite. They could have frequent bleeding breakthroughs. The patient should always be able to see the string from them. And if it dislodges, you want to worry about um, ectopic pregnancy, etc. Emergency contraceptive, you know, it reduces the pregnancy by 72%. It's not 100% effective. It's not abortive. So if they're already pregnant, it can't stop a pregnancy. Examples are Plan B. The copper IUD, it's a regular IUD, you know, that's used, but it could also be used as emergency contraceptive if inserted within seven days of um, them having the unprotective intercourse. It can stay in place for up to 10 years, and it could also be, like we said before, used as a regular birth control. We already discussed this in the previous section, so I'm going quite fast about this. But the hormonal replacement therapy, like I said before, there's a lot, a lot, a lot of risks, blood clots, breast cancer, heart disease. So, you know, it's really a question if the benefits outweigh the risks. 
if the benefits do outweigh the risk and you are gonna start it, you really wanna do it for as little, little, little as possible. It's usually used for menopausal symptoms like vaginal atrophy, hot flashes. There are two different types. You have your estrogen and estrogen progesterone. Then we go on to erectile dysfunction medications. You have your PDE5 inhibitors like sildenafil. Um, before you're giving these, you'll, you want to do baseline EKG, cardiovascular exam, because you have to make sure that the cardiovascular issue is not causing erectile dysfunction. So you first want to do a cardio workup, like a lipid profile, like I just said, EKG, you know, CMP, CBC, etc. It's contraindicated in anyone taking nitrates because the blood pressure will drop dangerously low if you take nitrates with, um, you know, Viagra, etc. Your BPH, your enlarged prostate. So your first line is the alpha blockers. You give very quick symptom relief because it vasodilates and relaxes the erythral structure, but side effects are hypotensive. So you want them to take it before bed. And it also could be used to treat hypertension with BPH. That's pretty much like the first line for that. You could also use your 5A reductase inhibitors, which basically shrinks down the prostate, but takes around like six months to see the benefits. That's why people like alpha blockers. Um, an example of that is finasteride. Side effect could cause erectile dysfunction, and what you should know, it's very tetragenic to pregnant women, so they should not come in contact with, you know, semen or even touch the pill if they are pregnant. Some herbs to take for BPH are salt palmetto that could be used. Um, next, we go on to musculoskeletal, and when we talk about the musculoskeletal system, the first line for osteoporosis is your biphosphonates, the olendronate, so alendronate, etc. What they do is that they inhibit the reabsorption of the bone by the osteoclast, so it increases the bone density. You want to take them the first thing in the morning by itself and make them, and one thing you should know about this is that you you want them to sit up right after for at least like 30 minutes because it could um, be very erosive to the esophagus, especially, you know, if they're laying down. You have your Tylenol that's given for musculoskeletal. You want to know the max dose side effect for the liver. It's, you know, very toxic. You have your NSAIDs that could be taken for musculoskeletal. So for your NSAIDs, the reason why we take it is because it has anti-inflammatory properties, ibuprofen, naproxen, and they're great for arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, but they have long-term side effects. They cause water and sodium retention, so they're really not good for heart failure patients. They increase the GI acid production, so they could lead to like mucosal damages like ulcers, GI bleeding. So they're really damaging to the GI system, especially if taken long-term. And they could decrease activity of platelets, so they're more prone to, to bleeding. So if someone's on warfarin or something else that thins the blood, you want to watch out for that. Um, and they're not good if someone has pre-existing kidney issues because they inhibit the prostaglandin, so there's less blood flow to the kidney. So even though people use NSAIDs all the time, ibuprofen, etc., if someone's taking it long term, they should not be taking it, especially if they have heart failure, GI, if they have kidney issues. So that's why we say Tylenol first. We also have the DMARDs. They're first line for rheumatoid arthritis because it slows down the disease, but you don't want to be prescribing this in primary care. This is something that rheumatologists would be prescribing, like your methotrexate, etc. And one of the things that you should be watching for them is your CBC, your liver function, and your renal function, and because it puts the patient's immune system at risk. Your gabapentin is an anticonvulsant, but it's put in the musculoskeletal system because it also could be used for nerve pain. It's a control substances in certain states, and it's sedating and could cause dependence. So you do want to watch out for that. In terms of gout, you have your alpurinol, and this is a maintenance. This is not for an acute attack. If someone's having a gout attack, you want to give like a potent NSAID like indomethacine or an, and a steroid. But if someone's doing this abortively, you could give them al alipurinol. What you should know about alipurinol is that it could decrease bone marrow so it leads to like a suppression. Next we go on to antibiotics. Antibiotics we have a whole video on itself you can look on the link above or below for that and that goes in under 10 minutes into full detail about all the antibiotics that you should know. 
in general, what you should know is a lot of antibiotics, one of the most side effects of all of them is diarrhea, C. diff, etc. Um, okay, so, so like I just said, we're going to be skipping, you know, the main antibiotics because we have a video on that. But some other miscellaneous common antibiotics that you should know, flagell. And one of the main side effects you should know about this is it has a metallic taste in the mouth. It's a, it's a first line for trick, bacterial vaginosis. And what you should know about this also is that they can't drink alcohol while they're on it because it could cause a disulfram-like reaction. Clindamycin, you should know about this, is that there's a risk for super infection because it could be because it could cause fatal colitis. Macrobide, first line for UTI, and vancomycin, you should know that's reserved for more serious infections. So anytime you think of MRSA, you think of vancomycin, and it's a first line for C. diff. Side effects, ototoxicity, nephrotoxicity, and red man syndrome. The next one that you should know is rifampin. Rifampin is used to treat TB, tuberculosis, and it has side effects that you got to educate your patient on because they're going to freak out if you don't tell them. So the side effects is secretions could turn red, thrombocytopenia is a big one, and it's toxic to the liver. But the main ones that they should know is the secretion turns red and obviously thrombocytopenia. For UTI, the first lines are Bactrim, Macrobid, and Ciproflax. For purulent cellulitis, I like to think of a BCD, Bactrim, Clindamycin, Doxycycline. So now here are just over-the-counter medications that people take all the time. So your topical nasal decongestions, you don't want them to use more than three days like we discussed before, cause rhinitis metacaminosia. Your antihistamines, you have your Benadryl is a big one. Um, you always want to avoid Benadryl in the elderly because it causes sedation. So you want to use Claritin instead because it's less sedating. For your cough, cold, sinus medications, you have your decongestions. You should not be giving a stimulant decongestion to someone like hypertensive, CAD, like we discussed before. And then we go on to the NSAIDs. You don't want to give someone aspirin if they're under 12 years old because there's a risk for Reed syndrome. Aspirin could also su suppress the platelet function, and you should know that it could also cause tinnitus. You want to avoid aspirin with patients in heart failure, heart disease, GI bleeding, and renal disease. Um, capsaicin topical cream is usually used for muscle or joint pain relief. It could take a few weeks for it to work, and you want to wash your hands after using it. Tylenol, very commonly used, so you want to know your max dose is 3,000 milligrams in 24 hours. That's very important to know because a lot of people take this like a lot of times a day. Do not use this if you're a heavy drinker, chronic hepatitis, liver disease, or cirrhosis because it's toxic to the liver. Antidote is acetylcysteine. Um, complementary medicines, you should know this because if your patient's on it, you want to know what, it, what they use it for and what it interacts with. So your main ones are your St. John's wort they like to ask on. It's used for depression and it has a lot, a lot, a lot of interactions. So palmetto, BPH symptoms, ginkgo, biloka is used for a lot of different stuff like memory problems, dementia, but it affects the blood clotting. So you want to stop it before surgery and not with NSAIDs, warfarin, etc. Next, we go on to controlled substances. So you have your different schedules. You have schedule one. Schedule one is not prescribed in the USA, so your heroin, PCP, etc. Your Schedule 2 is all the ones that have to be on original prescription, so you can't eat prescribed, but you have to actually write it and sign it. It's also only dispensed for 30 days, there's no refills, and the actual prescription expires in 6 months. Examples of this are cocaine, fentanyl, etc. Your Schedule 3s are your Tylenol with codeine, Vicodin, um, etc. Schedule 4s, Benzodiazepines, Ambien. And your Schedule 5s are your cough medications with less than 200 of codeine or Lyrica, etc. You should know that the regulations vary a lot by state and Schedule 3 could be prescribed over the phone, paper, electronically, and it has a max refill five times. 
some other stuff you should know is that you want to do a baseline eye exam and ask about visual symptoms for any of the following medications, Accutane, Topamax, Digoxin, corticosteroids, fluoroquinolones, Viagra, Cialis, etc. They all can affect the eye. Drugs that need to be tapered off so you don't want to stop them abruptly are your opioids, your benzodiazepines, propranolol, conidine, baclofen, steroids, gabapentin, etc. So here's a page just of labs. These you really have to know because a lot of times they won't tell you what normal is. You have to know what normal is to know what abnormal is. Here are routine screens. This is really just a PDF, so I'm really not going to read through each one. You could download the PDF click on the link below, download the PDF. It's really just memorization, to be honest with you. You have to memorize when they start screening, when they stop, how often, what you should know, like who needs to be screened before, and what is it used for. So here's just some screenings and more screenings. So that's pretty much for the comprehensive nurse practitioner review. So like I said, there are a few links where I go over in more detail. It's just, this is a really comprehensive, a fast, two hour, three hour course. For a real course, you need 10, 15 hours of going through the whole thing. So this is comprehensive, but it's short and quick. There are a few stuff I mentioned that you should, you know, memorize that, watch that video. All the links are below if you didn't catch it in the video. If you do want all this in a, a PDF form, you want to follow along and read it yourself, also check out the link below. And that's pretty much the end to the review. If you want tips and tricks on how to pass this exam, let me know in the comment section below. Thank you very much for watching. Please like and subscribe to this channel and stay tuned for more.